everybody. My name is Danielle Wheelwright. I am the Stroke Program Director for the Mount Sinai Health System. Uh, first of all, happy World Stroke Day. Uh, we are here to celebrate World Stroke Day and uh, we are offering our community this session talking about stroke. Uh, I'm going to spend the next 20 or so minutes chatting with you about what a stroke is, how we treat stroke, and also how you can reduce your risk of having a stroke. Okay, so quickly reviewing what we're going to be discussing in this session. I'm going to be talking about what a stroke actually is. We're going to talk about how you can recognize a stroke. We're going to talk about the treatment of stroke and also how to reduce, reduce your risk of having a stroke. First of all, although I wanted to cover some stroke facts with you all. In 2018, one in every six deaths from cardiovascular disease was due to stroke. In the United States, somebody is having a stroke every 40 seconds, and every four minutes, someone dies of stroke. Every year, more than 795,000 people in this country have a stroke, and about 610,000 of these are first or new strokes. And nearly one in four people, that's about 185,000 strokes, are people who've previously had a stroke. Stroke is expensive. In the United States, stroke-related costs came to nearly $46 billion between 2014 and 2015. And this includes the cost of healthcare services, medicines, and missed days of work. Stroke is the leading cause of serious long-term disability. Stroke reduces mobility in more than half of stroke survivors aged 65 and over. Risk of stroke varies with race and ethnicity, and the risk of having a first stroke is nearly twice as high for black versus white individuals. So what is a stroke? So the same way that we think about a heart attack, we need to think about stroke. A stroke is a brain attack. So it occurs when blood flow to a certain area of the brain is cut off. And when this happens, the brain cells are deprived of oxygen and nutrients and begin to die. And when these brain cells die during a stroke, the abilities controlled by that area of a brain, such as muscle control or speech or vision, are affected. And it's important to remember that there are two types of stroke. The most commonly seen stroke is ischemic stroke, and this accounts for about 85% of the strokes that we see. And then the remaining 15% are hemorrhagic strokes or brain bleeds, you might often hear them called. So looking at each of those a little bit more closely, we're gonna focus on ischemic stroke for about a minute. So ischemic stroke occurs when one of the arteries in the brain becomes blocked, and this is usually by a blood clot. And this blockage, this clot can form inside of the brain and occlude that particular vessel, or it can form outside of the brain, usually in the heart or in the blood vessels, in the neck, the carotid arteries. And this blood clot travels up into the brain where it becomes lodged. And as I mentioned, stroke makes up about 85% of these strokes. And you can see here in the picture that when that blood vessel becomes blocked, all of the uh, blood flow beyond that uh, occlusion stops. And so that's where those brain cells begin to die and that's where those symptoms begin to manifest. Hemorrhagic strokes or brain bleeds occur when blood from an artery begins to bleed into the brain. And there are two types of brain bleeds. I'm not going to go too deeply into these, but we have an intracerebral hemorrhage where there's a little tear uh, in the wall of a particular artery. Um, and then there's also a subarachnoid hemorrhage, and that occurs when there is a rupture of an aneurysm. And then finally, we have transient ischemic at attacks, and these are often referred to as mini strokes or TIAs. And it's the same process as, a, as an ischemic stroke, uh, as in it's, you know, this little blood clot that's forming somewhere within the body and occluding a particular blood vessel, but that clot is broken down and blood flow is restored to the brain before any permanent damage is caused. So these are tricky and people often ignore these symptoms. Um, people often go to bed or they don't follow up with 
the doctor or come to the hospital, but really these should be considered warning signs and absolutely should be treated uh, very seriously and emergently. So call 911 if you have uh, any such symptom. So one of the most important messages that I wanna get across to you today in this session is that time is brain. And every minute during a stroke, 1.9 million neurons die. So when we talk about moving fast and getting to the hospital and seeing a stroke doctor, we're really serious about that. So we need you to be fast and recognize stroke. In stroke, we use this acronym BFAST, and each of these letters in this BFAST represents a certain symptom or sign that we want you to be on the lookout for in yourself or in others, and call 911 if you see any of those. So the first one, B, is balance. And what we're really looking for here is any sudden onset issues with your balance, with your coordination. And these symptoms can also cause dizziness, nausea, and also vomiting. So if you feel suddenly off balance or clumsy, or, or if you have difficulty walking, dial 911. The E in our BFAST stands for eyes. And what this really is referring to is any sudden change in vision in one eye or in both eyes. So your vision might be blurred, uh, your vision might be doubled, or you might lose your vision completely. Uh, and if this happens, you really need to act fast. F stands for facial droop. And this probably is one of the most recognizable symptoms of stroke, and you've probably seen it. Um, in people who've had a stroke. Um, so what we're looking for is weakness on one side of the face. So if you see one side of the mouth drooping down or the, the cheeks sort of looking a little bit weak, um, think about calling 911. Ask whoever, if you're seeing it in someone else, ask them to smile or if you're noticing it in yourself, smile in the mirror and look, at, look for that asymmetry. A is for arms, though, the, this A really represents a lot more than just arms. So we're thinking about our legs as well. So if you notice weakness in one arm or leg or both, or if you notice a loss of sensation in one arm or leg or both, and we're really thinking about sudden onset weakness or sensation loss, you need to act fast and come to the emergency room. S is for speech. Do your words sound slurred? Uh, is it difficult to get your words out? Is, are you not making sense? Is it difficult for you to understand? Um, we sort of notice this in a lot of people and it can come across as being confused or even sometimes drunk. Um, but definitely think about getting to the hospital if you notice any of these issues with speech. And then the last one is time. Time is so important in stroke. As I mentioned, we lose nearly 2 million neurons every minute in acute stroke and our treatments for stroke are time sensitive. So come to the hospital as soon as you can, call 911, note what time the symptoms started uh, because this is one of the things that the stroke team is going to ask you when you arrive. And it's really important that you don't take a nap to see if it resolves. You don't drive yourself to the hospital, call an ambulance and don't just wait to see what happens. Really, really get to the hospital and get it sorted out as soon as you can. Moving on to the treatment of stroke. What do we do? What happens in the hospital when someone comes in with these stroke symptoms? For acute stroke, and this is for patients who really arrive within the specified time windows, we have a couple of treatment options for our patients. The first one, and the one that's been around the longest, is Alteplase. We call this TPA. And this is a clot busting medication. So it actually aims to dissolve the blood clot that's sitting in one of those blocked arteries. We give this intravenously. So when you come in, if you're eligible for this drug, someone will be racing to scan you and put your IVs in so that we can treat you as quickly as possible and give you this medication up to four and a half hours from the beginning of your stroke. The earlier, the better. As I mentioned, we want to save our neurons. We want to give this treatment as soon as possible, dissolve that clot, restore that blood flow to the brain. And this picture here on the right is just an infographic that really represents 
um, how effective this particular treatment is for treating acute stroke. And you can see that for uh, 100 patients given, all of those green people there, that represents those people who see an improvement uh, of their symptoms. And uh, as with most treatments, there is always a risk um, of bleeding. In this particular uh, medication, there is a small risk of bleeding. And you can see here with the red, there's um, those people who uh, didn't improve and actually did worsen in their symptoms. But as you can see overall, um, this drug is absolutely the gold standard and absolutely improves patients' outcomes. And this is what we give to all of our patients who are eligible coming in um, with acute stroke. And then the second treatment option is thrombectomy. And this is where we actually manually take the clot out. And not all strokes are eligible for this. We're looking for a particular type of stroke. Um, we call these large vessel occlusions. Um, and we can figure out who is eligible for this treatment by sending you to the CT suite, we'll scan you, we'll look at your blood vessels and look for any um, uh, very obvious occlusions that we can remove. So, you know, it's really cool. You move to the IR suites and uh, there's a catheter that's placed in your groin and the surgeons go up and put a tiny little suction catheter up into your brain and suck out that clot. And you can see that picture there um, at the top. Uh, is actually a picture of what that looks like when we when we take it out and as I hope you're getting the message with this talk earlier is always better and then again I have this infographic here on the right showing how effective this particular treatment is for stroke uh, very very effective you can see all these green people out of a hundred people benefiting from thrombectomy and we have um, just a small um, a uh, small number of people who uh, do not benefit. Moving on to preventing stroke and understanding your risk factors. So, you know, treating stroke is, is excellent and it's obviously very, very important, but we also wanna know uh, how can we actually prevent this from happening in the first place? And also if it has happened, how can we stop it from happening again? So we break our risk factors down into modifiable and unmodifiable risk factors. So there are a group of, or a number of risk factors that you absolutely can't do anything about. Um, we know about them, um, but you know, we're sort of locked into, uh, into that. And I've just listed them out here. You've got the first one, which is older age. So people above 80. While we do have race listed as an unmodifiable risk factor and genetics definitely do play a role, I think it's really important to acknowledge social inequities and the deeply rooted systemic issues that contribute to an increased stroke risk that we see in the black and Hispanic population. And here we're talking about access to healthcare, access to education, access to fresh and healthy food. We're talking about that acute and chronic stress that can come about from financial insecurity, that can come about from exposure to racism. And really the list does go on. And that is why it's so important that as a society, as a community, as a hospital, and as individuals that we are fighting for justice and equality in healthcare, and that we are working to dismantle systemic racism so that everybody, every community has the ability to live their best and most healthy life. Sex is an unmodifiable risk factor and we see a higher risk most ages are for men compared with women except for ages 35 to 44 years and over 85 where women have a similar or higher risk than men and then of course we have family history and any other genetic disorders and then moving on to our modifiable risk factors the first one is hypertension, and I know you've heard about this before, keeping your blood pressure in check. It's really important that you have a good plan and adhere to any medications that your PCP prescribes you and keep that blood pressure aiming for uh, below 120 on 80. Know what your blood glucose is and keep your diabetes in check if you have it. Cholesterol, 
HDL, the higher the better, and our LDL, we want to target under 100. And after stroke, we are a little bit more strict and tight with that target, and we aim to keep it under 70. Physical activity is so important. Keep active, keep moving, keep that heart rate uh, getting up and that blood pumping. Um, exercise frequently, and of course, no smoking. Diet, fresh is best, low salt, low fat, low sugar, um, everything in moderation. You know, you've got to be realistic in what uh, you can achieve. So just keep a balance and, you know, just keep everything in mod moderation. You are allowed to have uh, fun. And then obesity. We want to maintain a normal BMI of 18 to 25. I think the most important thing with uh, our risk factors is knowing your numbers. So talk to your primary care physician about your risk factors and how you can reduce your stroke risk. Know what your blood pressure is. Know what your blood glucose is blood glucose is, know what your cholesterol is, and really work to control these numbers. And utilize the resources around you. You have your, your PCP, the AHA, or uh, you know American Heart Association, American Stroke Association. They have so many resources um, on their site that you can access. There are mailing lists, and uh, the CDC is definitely another good one as well. So the takeaways, stroke, is an emergency. You need to move fast, learn be fast, and call 911 as soon as you notice any signs of stroke. Know your numbers, talk to your primary care physician, and work to reduce your stroke risk. And really important, eat a healthy diet, exercise regularly, and do everything you can to prevent this from happening. And I think the last thing is to really take this information away and spread it to your community. Tell your family, teach your family, teach your community members about Be Fast and uh, about how important it is um, to get to the hospital if you notice any signs of stroke. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, uh, if you want to reach out, I am always available. There is my email. Um, happy World Stroke Day. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.